And now we will move to the uh, next talk, and this will be about the role of the Planck constant in physics, the role of the constant of Planck in physics. This will be presented by uh, Jean-Philippe Usan. So Jean-Philippe Usan is a French uh, researcher in theoretical physics, uh, director of research at the French National Center for Scientific Research, CNRS, working at the Institut d'Astrophysique uh, de Paris. Uh, he graduated from the Ecole Nationale des Mines à Paris and received his PhD at Orsay University. His research in fundamental physics and cosmology focuses on theories of gravity, construction of cosmological models, and the description of the primordial universe. He is also widely known for the dissemination of science to the general public. So, Jean-Philippe Usan. Thank you. So, Mr. President, thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, Mr. Director of uh, BIPM, dear uh, distinguished delegate, uh, it's a real pleasure for me and an honor to, to, to be there today and to talk about fundamental constants. I must admit I'm just a theoretician. I mean, which means that I've never, you know, worked in a lab with uh, doing experiments, trying to measure things with high accuracy. I discovered fundamental constants about 20 years ago. I will try to explain to you how they came in my life. I was after my PhD. So we, today we are in Versailles, and we are here to, to, to discuss the possibility to change the, defini the definition of units, to ch change the way we think about them. And as you have heard, in this process, fundamental constants have come to the first line. But what are those fundamental constants? Why do they become so important now? I hope that together we can take the lenses of theoretical physics to try to get to know them a little bit better and uh, that we can understand a little bit their role in physics. And maybe you have heard and noticed from the previous talks, we are talking about experiments, but everywhere we, had, we were reminded that we are using some equations of physics to check relations. So what are these equations of physics? As a, as a student, when I was before my PhD, long, when I was a university student, I was uh, learning about Maxwell equations and the, the most the question I had in mind was not how to use Maxwell equation. I was wondering, how did Maxwell do to write down this equation? Because my dream, of course, was to write some kind of new equation as most students in theoretical physics. OK, so today we, we have been introduced to the Planck constant uh, in previous talks, to its connection to the kilogram. And uh, as you have heard, the proposed new system uh, of units uh, derives the base units on the numerical value of a set of fundamental constants. And uh, so that, at the, in the end, they are just related to a clock. This is indeed not a new idea because, as you also know, it, um, it, it was uh, already the way chosen to define the meter by fixing the value of the speed of light in vacuum in 1983. And also, this idea was floating around for, uh, in, the, in the practices on, of, of many theoreticians. So in practice, this is a big shift because we will abandon the reference to concrete objects, concrete physical phenomena, to relate the units to this constant, to more abstract objects. And to that, we have to understand a little bit what are those constants, what are these fundamental constants. And this is why in this talk, I would like first to try to make general, uh, to give you some general ideas about fundamental constants, and also to, uh, to discuss the Planck constant as the title was promising it to you. So the general trend to define units has been to, to, to relate them to the most fundamental properties of nature that we know. And this has changed with time. This was highlighted by Maxwell in a speech in 1870. And as he argues, the properties of the Earth are not stable enough to define the meter. And what he proposed is to relate the meter to uh, the properties of the object he was thinking at the time are the most fundamental, namely atoms. And you see he calls that molecules, but he has in mind atoms. And indeed, as he explained, if a structure is truly fundamental, it cannot change in time, it is unperishable, it is unalterable. But the more we learn of physics, the more we realize that what we think is fundamental is actually not. For instance, atoms are not fundamental. We know today that they are made of proton and neutron. neutron. We even know that these proton and neutrons are not fundamental. They are made of quark. Only the future may tell us if one day we have reached the most fundamental theory of nature to describe nature. Science only provides temporal descriptions. 
so that it is ever evolving. We will never be able, we have reached the most, the most fundamental theory. Fortunately, in practice, this is not really a problem because we have to use theories and the most important thing we have to do is to quantify the domain of validity of this theory so that we know they are good theory, they are a good description of nature and we know to which, which accuracy they allow us to describe nature. And these theories, they have constants. So what is a fundamental constant? The best way, I think, when we start to, do, to, to, to consider abstract objects is to go back to the basics. And the basics, to me, this is the dictionary. So years ago, I went back to the dictionary, and here is what I read concerning the definition of the word constant in the dictionary for physics. And we say that this uh, definition acknowledges the fact that there are objects which, um, uh, which are central, play a central role in the law of physics. It gives a list of some constants, like the mass and charge of the electrons, the speed of light. And uh, then it, it says also that their main characteristic is to enjoy a fixed value. This is actually what we call them constant. For a physicist, you see this definition raises more questions than it gives answers. Because how many constants do, do exist? Are they all uh, on the same level? Are there constants which are more fundamental? What are their role in the, in the laws of nature? And can they vary? According to the dictionary, no, by construction. But keep in mind that only experiment can tell us if this is correct. We cannot impose properties of nature by definitions. We have to create definition from what we learn about nature by studying it. So this is something that we can test. This is something that has been tested, and I will recall that in the end of my talk. So the definitions social always follow the properties of, of nature. And actually, defining concept is one of the most difficult uh, part of the work in theoretical physics. It's just a to solve equations, is to know what are the good concepts to build your theory on, how do you define, and how do you make that uh, very clear. So without the definition, what do we do? I think the best is to go back to the place where you find fundamental constants, that is in books of physics. If you were going to books of physics and reading a lot of textbooks, you will realize that the list of fundamental constants has changed with time. If you were taking a book before 1900, you won't find the Planck constant in this book. You will realize that, thus that some constants appear, like the Planck constant. Some constants can be explained in terms of other constant. For instance, when we understand that the proton is made of quarks, we can in principle relate the mass of the proton, which before was a fundamental constant, to the mass of his, and the properties of its constituents. A constant can disappear. For instance, the Joule constant is not used anymore. Why? Because we have understood that heat and work are just two forms of energy. We measure them both in Joule, and we, we, we have unified two concepts of physics. So this constant is just a conversion factor which became obsolete. And some constant may become units, and this is what happened to the speed of light in 1983, and maybe this is what is going to happen today for a set of them. This highlights a central feature. Fundamental constant and their status are intimately related to the theories of physics. We cannot talk of fundamental constant without talking of the theories of physics. So we have to state what we think are the good theory of physics to describe the world today. Today, I will claim that general relativity gives an extremely good description of gravitation, and it has been proven in many systems, and the recent detection of gravity waves is another proof of this. We have no hint of deviation from uh, general relativity. Electromagnetism the, two, electromagnetism, the two nuclear forces and matter fields are described by the standard model of particle physics. These models involve 23 constants. And, uh, and uh, 22 unknown parameters. They are all measured in, in, uh, in experiments, and in principle, other fundamental constants can be derived from this set of parameters. So I would say that given the fact that we have defined the set of theory with which you are working, the good definition of a fundamental constant will be any parameter which are not determined by this set of theory. They are not determined by this set of theory because in this series, there is no way you can predict their value. There is no equations for these parameters. There is nothing more fundamental in terms of which you can, you can measure them. So you just have to measure them. Um, so before I go on to the Planck constant, you have to realize that there are two different kinds of constants. 
They are constant without dimensions and constant with units. For instance, if I take the mass of the proton to the mass of the ratio, it's given by 1836 and blah, blah, blah. This number doesn't depend on the way you define the kilogram, on the kilogram itself. It's a pure number. It is a pure number that appears in the laws of nature. And actually, we don't understand this number. This number is a real mystery. If you are going to change the value of this quantity by a couple of percent, if you change the value of the fine sort of constant by a, per, a couple of percent, then you will realize that the phenomena of nature may be very different. Maybe some atoms may not be stable anymore. Maybe uh, complexity will not emerge in the universe. Maybe life will, will not be uh, uh, possible in the universe. So these numbers, a lot of theoreticians think that they, they need for an explanation and maybe it could be explained by a, a new fundamental theory. Then you have all the constant with units. The numerical value is completely contingent. And as expressed by Max Planck in 1900, you can use them to define your units. For instance, if you want to define the meter, the kilogram, uh, the second, and, and the, the Kelvin, you will need four fundamental constants, and this is actually what Max Planck was doing. And what he assumed is that the value of these four constants, speed of light, gravitational constant, Planck and Boltzmann constant, to unity, then it defines a set of fundamental units. And as Klaus von Klesin was telling us before, you see these units are not practical for daily life. They are just very useful for theoretical physicists working on quantum gravity. So any people working on quantum gravity is actually using these units. This idea was not new. A similar idea was proposed by George Johnston Stoney in 1974. He, he, he had a, an idea of the value of the charge of the electron. Fortunately for you, Klaus, he didn't know about the Planck constant. But using the gravitational constant, the speed of light, and the electric charge, he defined a unit of time, of length, and, and, and of mass. So we see we can use the constant to define units. So the proposal we consider today is very close to Planck idea, but it's very, it's, it's a quite little bit different. It's very satisfactory for, from an, uh, an intellectual point of view, but we cannot go as far as Planck. And there are three reasons for that. First, we cannot use the gravitational constant so that we have to keep a clock in the business. Second, these units are, the, the Planck units are not well suited for, for daily life. And third, the numerical value of the Planck constant are inherited from the early definitions of the units. So actually, these numbers have, have an history. If we have to fix them, we have to fix them so that we have a continuity of the definition of the unit. So maybe it's too late to take them equal to one. Yes, it's a pity. We should have done that one century ago, maybe. So to define the meter, kilogram, and Kelvin, and ampere, we need four constants. So on which criteria should we choose this, const this constant? So we want this constant to, to be universal, so that they appear, uh, they are not restricted to a single phenomena. We, we want them to be fundamental, and as I said before, they are fundamental in, in the sense that there is nothing more fundamental in terms of which you can compute them. And we have some experimental pragmatism. You should be able to measure them in the laboratory with dedicated techniques. So instead of trying to develop that with a long theoretical speech, let me now illustrate all this on the history of the, the, the Planck constant. So the Planck constant, what is the context? We are at the turn of uh, the, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and one of the lively de debates is the under understanding of the black body spectrum. The this is a radiation which is at equilibrium in an, in an oven at a temperature T, and here you see the distribution of the energy as a function of the wavelength lambda for different temperature of the oven. So there was a lively debate at that time to understand this spectrum, and in, uh, in the 19th of October 900, uh, Planck came with a formula in which you have two parameters, C and C prime, that you can actually measure using these curves. That was the beginning of the story. But Planck needed to, to justify this formula, and to that, he went back to the, to the basics of physics, and a couple of weeks later, in Jan January 1901, he published this article, which actually he presented the results in the December the 14th at the German Academy of Science. So what is Planck doing in this uh, paper? His goal is simple. He wants to reproduce the formula he found for the, spec for the spectrum. He will make two main assumptions. First, 
he used the definition of the entropy that was proposed by Boltzmann in 1977 to relate the macroscopic thermodynamic quantity, entropy, to the microscopic nature of radiation. So this is very new, actually. Not a lot of people were interested in, in that way of thinking. Today, we do uh, statistical physics. We understand the connection between thermodynamics and microphysics, but this was just the beginning of uh, this, uh, this part of physics. Here, a remark is in order. You see he's writing uh, an equation, number three, and this equation, in this equation he's introducing a constant, k, that today we call the Boltzmann's constant, but actually Max Planck was the first one to write down this equation. For Boltzmann, Boltzmann just stated the proportionality between entropy and this quantity, W. So this is the first point. Connection between microscopic and microscopic. And then he has to assume something about the energy exchange between matter and radiation. And he assumes that it just happens in energy elements, in pieces of energy, in what we call today quanta. And he used this formula to say what is the typical en uh, quantum on energy, epsilon, that he relied to the, to the frequency nu. And because energy is measured in joule and frequency in hertz, you cannot equal them. You need a constant, a constant with a dimension, and this is the Planck constant. You will, re you will realize here that this, this equation has no number. And actually, in the paper, Planck is not trying to justify why this is a, a very important equation of physics. No, he used it because, because this is just the correct assumption to find the right result for the Planck spectrum. So basically, we could say it's almost reverse engineering. You, you find the formula that you want to understand. And then Max Planck is, uh, is uh, stating that hereby sind H und K universelle constante, H and K, so the two Planck constant are universal constant. And as I said before, you need to measure the value of this constant. And uh, with uh, the Planck spectrum, he was able to give the first value of the Planck constant and the, so to become Boltzmann constant. This is the first step. But then, then you can ask the question, what is the status of this equation, the Planck equation related energy and frequency? At this stage, it was very controversial. Some people thought that, well, this is just an effective way to describe the relation, uh, the, the interaction between matter and electromagnetic and radiation, and that it will, we could explain this equation from a better understanding of, of electromagnetism. Some people saw that it was a, a deeper, actually. Uh, it tells us something deeper on nature. And I think the rise to universality comes through this beautiful paper by Albert Einstein in 1905. Because there he is doing something revolutionary. For Max Planck, the quanta was just for the energy exchange between matter and radiation. What Einstein will assume is that radiation is a fluid made of energy element, of packets of energy. And the, the thing to keep in mind is like, if you basically just buy water by bottles of half a liter, okay, you can buy water by bottle of half a liter. It doesn't mean that water just exists in bottle of half a liter. What Einstein is assuming is that water always exists just in bottle of half a liter. So there is no way you can take half a bottle, for instance. So this is revolutionary, especially in a time where light was very well described by Maxwell theory, both from a theoretical and an, and an experimental point of view. So this was something, a big shift. And Einstein gave a consequence from, to, from this hypothesis. This is a photoelectric effect. It was checked by Robert Millikan uh, uh, 10 years later, and it allows him to give a new value of the Planck constant. The, world pho the word photon will, will become in 1926, and in the meantime, Arthur Compton was able to, to, to show that this particle of light has a momentum. He was saying as a diffusion of, of X-ray photon on electron. So basically, light was made of some kind of particle. So you see there is a big shift here. We are not just talking about how matter and radiation interact. We see that radiation itself, light itself, has a double nature. It is well described by Maxwell theory, but it has also this particle behavior. So this is the first step. Then it was understood, and in particular by the work by Louis de Breuil in 1924 in his PhD thesis, that this could be applied to any kind of particles, to electrons, for instance. He said that any particle has to also to be as described by a wave. And this is the birth of a new concept, the concept of 
uh, wave function, and this concept is at the heart of quantum mechanics. And because particles are described by momentum and energy and wave by frequency and wavelengths, you cannot equal them. You have to find something to make a new concept. And this is the Planck constant, which, is, which allow you to relate the property of mad particles and the property of wave. So you see here, we, we see the fundamental constant in action. It allows you to synthesize new concepts. You had particle, you had wave. Now you know that you need a wave function and you understand how you can recover the, the old uh, notion of particle and wave in a certain limit, which we call the classical limit. So here, the Planck constant takes a new step. It's not only something which is related to the property of light, it's related to the property in matter, in the, in the whole type of matter. This duality between particle and wave was actually uh, checked uh, by experiment on the electron, the diffraction, which is a wave property of the electron that we saw before were just particles. And this idea was even suggested by De Broglie himself uh, after, uh, during his, his, uh, his uh, PhD uh, defense. So we see that H allowed to synthesize this new concept of wave function, the wave function is basically uh, the, the cornerstone, the object you need to manipulate in quantum mechanics, which means that the Planck constant will appear everywhere when you have quantum phenomena. It will appear everywhere, in the property of atomic spectra, in solid state physics, and so on, and we had many examples of that in the previous uh, presentation. Then it was understood that the Planck constant is even more fundamental than, than this. In 1911, at the Congress Solvay, Planck suggested that the Planck constant is a quantum of action. So the elementary unit in phase space. So this is a bit abstract, a bit theoretical, and I don't want you to understand that, but this is very important because it paves the way to a new formulation of quantum me mechanics that was developed by Richard Feynman in, 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 uh, in the 40s and 50s. With this, with this uh, way of formulating quantum mechanics, you understand the classical limit, and you understand that the Planck constant actually is a way to quantify the domain of validity of quantum mechanics. In 1927, Werner Heisenberg was questioning the validity of the old classical concept that we were using, like the concept of trajectory, because remember, if a particle is not just a particle, but also a wave, what does it mean to, to say that a particle has a trajectory? And he showed that quantum mechanics quantum mechanics put an intrinsic uncertainty on any measurements. And basically, this uncertainty principle uh, make, uh, is, relate, is uh, quantified by the value of the Planck constant divided by, by 2 pi. Hence, we see that the Planck constant is a sign of the quantum everywhere. It allows one to understand the classical limit, and it signals when quantum effect cannot be neglected. Quantum theory is what we call a frame theory. We think that any theory of nature has to be quantum. So if this is the case, then the Planck constant will enter everywhere. It's really a universal constant. It's not related to a phenomena or to a class of phenomena. So this short story on the Planck constant can be told by, for any of the other constants, the speed of light, the charge of the electron, and the, constant, the Boltzmann constant. The speed of light has the same kind of history. It was shown I mean, that it was not infinite by a rumor, the astro an astronomer at the Observatory de, uh, de Paris. And then it was understood by Maxwell that this is also the speed of propagation of any uh, electromagnetic wave in vacuum. But you have to wait for Einstein again in 1905 to understand that C is at the, the heart of uh, uh, special relativity. You, this is, uh, the, it's related to the concept of causality, and whatever theory we make, we have to have causality. It also has to be a, a special relativistic version, so that special relativity is also a frame theory. And the speed of light allows to take the old concept of space and time to create the new concept of space-time, and we know how fruitful is this concept, because then it was generalized to general relativity to describe gravitation. So to that respect, the, the speed of light and the Planck constant has, are probably the two most fundamental constants we know. They, they appear everywhere in physics. Then we have the charge of the electron. This is the charge of the electron, but this is also the, the, the quanta of charge, the unit of charge. And this is also the coupling constant of electromagnetism phenomena. So it enters in a whole class of phenomena. The Boltzmann constant uh, allows us to to go to the large number system, to relate the microscopic to the microscopic. And it doesn't have the same theory, because if you were writing down 
a fundamental theory like quantum chromodynamics, you will not see the Boltzmann constant. It appears only when you go from the microscopic to the, microscopic to the, to the macroscopic. So we see that the evolution and the, na the nature of the nature and of the status of this constant are related to the progresses of physics and to our understanding of physics. And this is something which shows that you always need um, your theoretical physics to think about these things. Oops, what's happening here? I want the next slide. And I last slide. There is some. It doesn't work. Ah, thank you very much. You see, I'm a theoretical physics. I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> At least you have the proof. Okay, so, so to conclude, what do we have to keep in mind? First, that constant cannot be sought outside a theoretical framework. So you, you always have to, to state what are the, the, the series of physics that you assume describe nature today. They can only be measured, and they allow us to forge new concepts. So they are really like uh, dynamics in, the, in, in our way of thinking about physics. I have distinguished also two types of constants, those with dimension and those which are dimensionless. The first can be used to, to define units, and this is what we are doing with the speed of light, the Planck and Boltzmann constants, and the, the electric charge. Then once you have done that, all other fundamental constants are dimensionless. So their numerical values are, uh, are very important because they are pure numbers, and the value of these pure numbers are really uh, important to understand the magnitude of many physical phenomena. It is a dream of theoreticians to explain these numbers, and it has even been checked that they are not changing with time. And actually, this is where, where I started to be interested in fundamental constants. Are we sure that fundamental constants, this number without dimension, keep the same value in the whole history of the universe? Because many times before me, it has been said that these units will be defined throughout the age of the universe. And working in cosmology, I can tell you that to make such a statement is something very bold. Can we be sure that the fine structure constant, the ratio between mass of the electron and mass of the proton, keeps the same value across the age of the universe? In 99, there was a paper published in Physical Review Letters claiming that the fine structure constant was smaller by 10 to the minus 5 about 10 giga years ago, two-thirds of the age of the universe. I was just finishing my PhD, I was reading this paper and I didn't understand how this is possible because this is a constant. And as I told you, it took me quite a while to understand that you don't have to believe dictionaries when they talk about physics. You just have to think about what you are measuring. Once you do that, this is what I, I came to try to understand what are fundamental constants and to develop many tests of the fact that fundamental constants are keeping the same value in, during the whole age of the universe. Today, we know from experiments that they are not varying by 10 to the minus 16 per year in the laboratory by comparing atomic clocks, and that they are not varying by more than 0.1% on the whole age of the universe, 13.7 giga years. So you see, we are pretty sure that they are not varying quite a lot. This test of the test of the constancy of fundamental constant is crucial. If we ever show that it, it's violated, it will also show that one basic, uh, that, that a fundamental principle called the equivalent Einstein principle is violated. And if this is the case, it means that we have to extend general relativity. And I don't want to scare you, but if we have that, I'm not even sure that we will just need one kilogram in the unit system. Maybe you will need one kilogram for gravitation and one for inertia. So you see, there was a question before, are we sure that this is the end of our system of units? Maybe not. The more we discover about physics, the more we may have to include new phenomena in our description, and maybe it will require new units. We cannot know. The only thing we know, because we are testing the, the, the validity of our theories, is that this will not affect the phenomena which are well described by this theory. So it will, it will always be possible to do that in continuity. So this is a dynamic of science, and I think it, we have to keep that in mind. So to finish, I want just to emphasize that what we are doing here is just a human enterprise. As I said before, we may know that we will never reach the most fundamental theory of nature, but we also know that at every step in our understanding of nature, we have to find our representation of the world on the most fundamental theories and on their concepts. Only theory, experiment, and the care for a precise language will allow us to reach this goal and emphasize the importance of the value of science for society and the rational thinking to guide us in our public choices. 
I've heard the word revolution many times in uh, this morning. And then I said, well, maybe I should cite, cite Antoine de Lavoisier in his introduction to chemistry written in 1789. There he wrote that that language cannot be perfected without perfecting science, nor science without language, and that whatever certain the fact may be, whatever correct the ideas may be, they will only provide wrong impression if we did not have exact expression to convey them. 1789, the French Revolution, that's why. So this is what is proposed today with the fundamental constant for metrology. It is so beautiful to see theoretical physics ideas, experimental facts, and metrological techniques and savoir-faire to convert to a unified and elegant system of units. It may be more abstract, but I am confident that with education and time, as Professor Bill Phillips will probably explain to us later, we may get used to this and uh, finish to find, uh, to find the correct words. I hope we will all engage in that in, in, on this road. Thank you very much.